Welcome uh, everybody listening to this to the first of the series of virtual fireside uh, talks and we're very very honoured indeed to have uh, Lord King tonight, Mervyn King, uh, who is going to be uh, talking about uh, radical uncertainty and the economy and, and Covid. It's going to be in three parts tonight. Uh, Mervyn King is going to talk for roughly 20 minutes. I will be asking questions for roughly 20 minutes and then I'm going to pick up uh, questions that you've asked. So do uh, ping them uh, in and I'll be looking uh, at the box on my right hand side. Um, now, uh, some of you may remember that three years ago we had John Kay, who has written two books uh, before with Mervyn King, uh, one going all the way back to 1978-79, uh, and the wonderful, wonderful uh, book Radical Uncertainty earlier this year. Um, and he was speaking about some of the ideas in Radical Uncertainty there, John Kay. Uh, Mervyn King, no stranger to the county, born in the wrong end of the county down in Cheshire and Boys, um, no stranger to the university. He's been extremely helpful to Ed Smith, uh, who, sets, who set up our Institute for Sports Humanities. Uh, and thank you very, very much indeed, Mervyn, for being our first. Uh, and it's wonderful to have such a distinguished speaker. So I think that's all by way of introduction. Um, you will not be seeing Mervyn King on this. You'll most certainly be hearing him in subsequent uh, talks on our technology improves. We will be uh, showing you the person I'm interacting with. Mervyn King. Anthony, thank you very much indeed. And I'm delighted to join you all. It's, it's almost a family occasion at the University of Buckingham. And I should add, to be clear, that the failure of my uh, of my appearing on screen is entirely the result of my inadequate technology, not yours. So I'm going to start by <clears throat> talking a little bit about the similarities and differences between the current COVID-19 crisis and the banking crisis of just over a decade ago. There are some strong similarities, but also obviously some differences, but it's the similarities I think that are worth pursuing. Both of these crises were classic examples of what John Kay and I in our book call radical uncertainty. They were not black swans. A black swan is something where you can't even imagine that it could conceivably happen. When the first settlers went out to Australia, they couldn't have imagined, they couldn't have bet each other on deck that the first swan they would see in Australia would be black. It just never occurred to them that it could be. But we did know that there were things called banking crises. We'd had a number of them in the past, and we certainly knew that there were pandemics. But the whole point of recognizing that was that in both cases, the fact that we knew they could occur did not enable us to predict either when or where or what kind of banking crisis or what kind of virus would actually hit us. And for that reason, we could not possibly make statements of the kind last year, for example. I bet you, Anthony, that the there is a, you know, do you bet me four to one that there will be a virus coming out of Wuhan in China in December? That kind of statement just could not be made. And that's very important because it means that we can't quantify the uncertainty attached either to a banking crisis or to the possibility of a pandemic. And if we can't attach probabilities to them, then I think we need to think somewhat more deeply about how we make decisions when confronted with this kind of radical uncertainty, uncertainty that can't be quantified. We know something, but not enough to be able to, to quantify it. And the obvious conclusion from it, and it's one that we learned only after the event of the banking crisis, is that you can't predict when or where, so there's no point devoting a lot of resources to trying to understand when or where. But it is worthwhile devoting resources to ensuring that if a crisis were to occur, the system was resilient and robust. And we failed to do that for the banking crisis before 2007-8 because we had allowed the banking system to run down its holdings of highly liquid assets, 
so that if there were to be a loss of confidence in the banking system and people who were lending to the banks short term would no longer be willing to continue to lend, the banks would then need cash. They didn't have liquid assets to turn into cash. They had to turn to the Bank of England. And interestingly, only 50 years before that event, we were in a position where one third of the balance sheet of the banking system was in highly liquid government securities that could easily be converted into cash. So that that aspect of resilience on the liquidity side, we had allowed to run down almost to zero. And then on the other side of the balance sheet, the fraction of the liabilities issued uh, by banks were in the form of equity was very low so that if they were to uh, experience losses on the assets and on their balance sheet, then the equity would very quickly be absorbed by those losses and there would be a risk that they would be defaulting to their creditors. And that would be a very strong reason for people not to want to be willing to lend to banks. Now we learned the lesson from all this because the, the John Vickers Commission after the banking crisis recommended two things that would have been very familiar to people, engineers who design, whether it's nuclear power plants or aircraft, namely that they would try to ensure that if one part of the system failed, it wouldn't bring down the entire system. And so the Vickers Commission recommended ring fencing between some of the riskier investment banking activities and the normal retail banking operations. And that's something that would be very familiar to an engineer trying to ensure that that part of the one part of the system couldn't bring down the whole. The other recommendation that he made was that banks have to issue more equity. In other words, to create more redundancy in their equity issuance. Again, a familiar result from engineering, which is you just make the system safer than you think you will really need just to be on the safe side because you can't be entirely sure what might happen. Now, these lessons of resilience and robustness, which we uh, uh, learnt about the banking system only after the banking system failed, sadly, we did not apply to the health system or indeed any other critical part of the economic system in the UK. So one of the disappointing aspects of what has happened in the last couple of months is that when the really at the end of last year, various international agencies drew up a, an, an assessment of the preparedness of major countries for a pandemic. And lo and behold, the top two countries in terms of preparedness were the United States and United Kingdom. And at a very high level in terms of a committee structure for government, we seem to be well prepared. But what happened in practice, of course, was that our systems turned out not to be anywhere near as resilient or robust as we had hoped. We had not put in place plans to be able to increase the number of intensive care beds quickly. I think we should be very uh, appreciative of the ingenuity which led to the construction of the Nightingale hospitals, but it wasn't something which was there and as a practical plan to swing into operation. The testing clearly was not something which we had thought about sufficiently uh, in practical terms. And even smaller things like the loan scheme to try to ensure that small businesses could uh, cope with measures to shut down part of the economy that loan scheme seemed fine in principle on paper, but in practice it proved very difficult to get the banks to be willing to absorb the number of claims and ensure that the loans backed by the government could be made. In other words, it was the logistical failures that proved worrying. And I think that the, the is a big lesson here from study of military history, which is you can have the best general in the world in terms of strategy. But if they don't have good people managing the logistics, then you won't win a battle if you can't bring the troops to the right place at the right time, nor the ammunition uh, or any other supplies that you actually need to support the army. So I think I'm sure that one of the uh, 
consequences of the post-mortem that will come out of all this is that resilience and robustness of the health service will be seen to be something in which we should invest. And indeed, it's a lesson that should carry over to every part of the economy, whether it's a critical system. And you could think of that in terms of electricity supply. You can think of it in terms of trying to ensure resilience of our um, internet and cyber communications with each other. If these things are resilient and robust with respect to various unexpected attacks, then we'll be in much better shape. In other words, the big lesson here, and this is the, the, the overarching point, I think, is that survival is very important, not just efficiency and profitability. And in terms of the banking system before the crisis, we had put a great deal of weight on efficiency and profitability of the banking system, but very little weight on the measures that you would need to ensure its survival when something rather dramatic happened. Now, of course, there are also big differences between the banking crisis and the COVID-19 crisis. I think the most important one of which is that the banking crisis was much easier to deal with because the problems were uh, originated. We could see the problems in the banking sector. I think there were deeper problems that were which were the ultimate cause of the banking crisis, but they were really to do with the with developments in the world economy. But in terms of the UK, uh, we only had to deal with the banking sector. And in, in whereas with COVID-19, we're having to deal with every part of the economy. Every person in the economy has been affected. But there was a more important difference, perhaps, which was we had a vaccine for the banking sector. And that vaccine was the recapitalization of the banking sector. The liquidity problems that the banks complained about were merely symptoms of a deeper problem, namely that people had little confidence in the likely scale of losses that could emerge bank by bank. And so they were very reluctant to lend to them. And until the banks were forced to issue a lot of new equity capital, then the financial markets we're never going to regain confidence in the banking sector. And as soon as that recapitalization took place, the UK was the first uh, to announce it in October uh, 2008. The US followed afterwards. And by the spring of 2009, the banking crisis was over. I think it's going to be much harder with COVID-19 because we don't know what the vaccine is. We don't know whether there is a vaccine. We hope there will be. Uh, there's a lot of effort is going into trying to find it, and then it will have to be produced on a scale sufficient to inoculate the population as a whole. But there's a great deal of uncertainty about all that. There's one other factor, I think, which unites the banking and the COVID-19 crisis, which concerns the role of expert advice models to understand what is going on. And in our book, John Kay and I talk quite a lot about what we call bogus quantification. That is the belief that there are numbers out there which you, somebody, some expert will find for you and you can plug it into a computer model and you turn the handle and out comes the result or the advice. And it's very striking that the government uh, has in its comments to us and in a letter which Boris Johnson sent to everyone in every household in the country uh, a few weeks ago, said we will do what the science tells us we must do. And of course, the key point is that science doesn't tell us what we must do. And this is all about the nature of models. Both economic models and the epidemiological models are actually not very good at forecasting. What they are good at doing is giving us genuine insights into the nature of economic problems on the one hand and the epidemiology of um, a disease spreading through the population on the other. And if we take COVID-19, what is very striking about it is that the epidemiological models have parameters in them which are very important in determining the result. 
the general shape of an epidemic is what the model tells you. That is, it starts slowly and you don't really see many cases. And by the time you've noticed the epidemic is there, it's suddenly accelerating away from you and it reaches a peak and then starts to decline again as a seriously large proportion of the population has been infected and either recovered or died. And that's very important to understand that shape of an epidemic because it gives you the insight that there may be some merit in trying to intervene to flatten the curve, as we've heard, in order that the health services do not become overwhelmed. But it's very different from that proposition to argue that the models can actually predict the number of infections or the future path of the epidemic. And one reason is, and this is common to all economic models as well, that their predictions depend on behavior, human behavior, not just scientific knowledge. So let me just step back for a minute before making that clear to give you a contrast with an example we use in the book in which the American Space Agency, NASA, sent a rocket to Mercury and it took sort of seven years to get there, but it arrived exactly on time and on the place where they said it would. And the reason that could be done and NASA was so successful was threefold. First, the laws of the planetary motions and the behavior of rockets in space are understood and have been understood for several centuries. Secondly, those laws don't change over time. And thirdly, the motion of a planet is not dependent on what we believe about the motion of a planet. It does its own thing. None of these are true of the economy. We don't fully understand the behavior of the economy. It does change over time and it certainly depends on our behavior. That is our expectations about what the future holds can drive the behavior of the economy. And this is when I come back to COVID-19 because one of the most important parameters in the models that are being used are assumptions about how the introduction of restrictions and then the relaxation of those restrictions will affect the spread of the disease. And that depends on judgments about our behavior. And it's not something which can be easily modeled. On top of that, we hear a great deal about the R value, this reproduction rate of the virus, in which um, as, as if it's sort of a, a, a scientific number that we can measure and uh, we have to sort of follow it rigidly. The difficulty with this is that the, the R number varies a great deal from one activity to another, from one region to another, and actually from one person to another. Some people are much more likely to spread the virus than others. And what this suggests is that the heterogeneity of this R figure among the population means that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have economy-wide policies based on some average value of R. The, the principle behind it, which is a good one, is what we're trying to do is to limit the spread of the infection. And we do that by imposing restrictions on those activities which are more likely to lead to a spread of infection than others. So obviously uh, theatres and concert halls are going to be open later than other activities because a large number of people inside are more likely to infect each other. Same is true of bars and restaurants. But I think that the, the, the message that we were given at the very beginning, which was stay at home, was simply too broad brush and it was applied to every kind of activity. It's hard to see that people sitting in a park several meters from each other can actually be regarded as uh, violating social distancing or increasing the risk of the spread of the infection. And choosing between these activities is going to be extremely difficult. We just don't know the numbers here. And the only answer is, I think now looking ahead, trial and error. The, the way we will get out of this is by trying to relax some of the restrictions, see what happens, and then we can either reimpose the restrictions if infections go up or start to relax other infections. Let me come back 
to the question of macroeconomics and the impact of uncertainty on economic models there. I want to give you one example of a model in economics which is very valuable and indeed actually the people who produced it got Nobel Prizes for it. The efficient markets hypothesis which basically says all publicly known information is already encapsulated into today's market prices. And what that tells you is that if you've got a good idea about an investment and you think about backing it on the stock market, ask yourself the question, why do I think I'm the first person to have this idea? And if I'm not, it may be a very good idea, but it may already be priced in the market. And so I won't be able to earn super normal returns by investing in it. This is a very important lesson for anyone investing to understand, but it's not a description of the world. It's an insight. The, the model is, is a parable, not a description of the world. And all the richest people in the world, investors like Warren Buffett, have made money out of situations where the efficient markets hypothesis does not describe what happens in the world. So I think this is, it's very important to realize the limitations then of models. Let me just finish with a few words on current economic policy. I think it's very important to understand that the cost of the crisis today in economic terms is not measured by the size of the government's borrowing or the addition to national debt. The schemes which the government has put in place are very sensible schemes to try to avoid businesses going bust simply because the government has decided to shut down the economy. There will come a point when we can reopen the market economy and then allow those businesses who will have good opportunities to thrive and those businesses for which there isn't a good market to fail. But this is not the moment to allow businesses to fail. And so we need schemes to ensure that they can continue. The increase in the national debt will be very large. It may even add 20, 30 odd basis points to the ratio of national debt to national income. But we shouldn't worry too much about that. The payments which the government is making are transfer payments from taxpayers in general to businesses. They are not a cost to the economy as a whole. It doesn't correspond to lost income. It's a transfer payment which will uh, be financed by the government borrowing a lot over the next year or two. And at that point, we will have a much higher ratio of national debt to national income than we had at the beginning of this year. Now, we can afford that now for two reasons. One is that if one is prudent with public finances in normal times, then you can start with a debt to income ratio which is one from which you can then afford to see a sharp rise. The UK is in a position to do that. Italy is not. And secondly, that the very low level of long term real interest rates of which the government can borrow is immensely helpful in finding a route to finance uh, the crisis. Because once we get through this and once a vaccine has been introduced, the government will want to say, well, OK, we now know where we are with the higher levels of debt. How can we slowly bring down this ratio of national debt to national income? And the key to it is to ensure that the interest rate at which the government is borrowing, adjusted for inflation, the real interest rate, is, is lower than the growth rate of the economy. Well, it turns out that the real interest rate today is pretty close to zero. So as long as we can restore some normal, even if not very exciting, but just normal economic growth, we will be in a position where the ratio of national debt to national income will come down, even without any significant increase in taxes or cuts in spending. And it certainly would be a mistake to raise taxes and cut spending over the next year or so, because that really would damage the ability of the economy to be able to recover. The real economic cost of this crisis is generated by the lost incomes and output, lost GDP, as a result of the shutdown of the economy. British GDP 
UK GDP is about two and a quarter trillion pounds a year. And people are guessing. I mean, we can't possibly know what the ultimate loss of GDP will be, but it's something like 10% or more of annual GDP. That amounts to 250 billion pounds. That's a lot of a lot of money, a lot of resources which are being wasted. So the challenge now is really to try to return the economy to a path along which we can see incomes and GDP begin to rise again while maintaining social distancing. And that'll be easier for some sectors than other, others, and that's what we have to focus on. But I think the, the big lesson I would sort of conclude on here is that we should be wary of quantitative predictions here. We'll have to follow a trial and error process of opening up the economy. And one of the big lessons that we'll all learn at the end of it, I think, is that we can't pretend to know when or where either a banking crisis or a pandemic or indeed any other kind of uh, crisis that could affect our survival, such as evolution of climate change. We can't easily predict when or where that will happen. But what we ought to be doing is focusing on measures to improve the resilience and robustness of our economy. And if we do that, then I think tilting the balance <clears throat> a bit more towards survival and a bit less away from uh, efficiency and profitability would be, I think, the big lesson that we should take out of this experience and which is indeed the main lesson from, from I think, the study of radical uncertainty. Well, let me stop there, Anthony, and, and then over to you. Thank you, Mervyn, very much indeed. So uh, welcome to those um, viewers, listeners who've joined us. Uh, we're now well over 100. Uh, we have Lord King talking to us, a uh, very distinguished governor of the Bank of England from 2003 to 2013, in between the Eddie George and the Mark Carney uh, regimes. And uh, he's been talking about radical uncertainty and the economy, as you've been hearing, uh, comparing COVID. Uh, with the banking crisis of which he was the very at the very heart of the uh, successful uh, journey uh, out of it and beyond when Gordon Brown was prime minister. So um, uh, questions, can I ask uh, questions to start coming through? Uh, we're now into the second part of the um, uh, of the talk where I'm going to be asking Mervyn King some questions. Um, foreshadowing there the talk later this week on Thursday in Lord King's final comments there about uh, risks again, coming back to risks to the country. We have uh, Martin Rees, former president of the Royal Society, former astronomer royal, talking about um, uh, will uh, man, humankind survive uh, to the end of uh, this century? So uh, looking there at the, the, the question uh, of um, more emphasis on uh, resilience, uh, robustness, um, more on longer term, uh, a little bit less on shorter term uh, issues of um, uh, profitability. Uh, is that going to happen with a government that has a five year cycle? Uh, is the economic and medical logic conflicting with the political reality of uh, politicians uh, needing to be re-elected? Well, to some extent, yes, and I think our own history shows that the UK has not been very good at taking a long term view for projects which improve our long term economic prosperity, whether it's in the field of resilience or robustness or or other fields. Um, I don't quite know how we are easily going to overcome this other than to say that I think we ought to make much more use of a a body that was set up some years ago but hasn't done a great deal, a sort of bipartisan or expert group to think about infrastructure projects. And I think that there are a whole series of areas of policy, whether it's social care, whether it's the health service and how to finance it. It was true of the pension system, but with the only way in which we managed to reform our own pension system was to try and do it on a bipartisan basis. And I think that is really very important. One of the big lessons of the immediate post-war period was that areas in which we were successful were those in which the Conservative government in the 1950s uh, 
didn't change the inheritance it took from the Labour government in the late 40s. But the area in which we failed most, the steel industry, went through a whole series of being nationalised, then denationalised, then renationalised. Uh, none of this makes very much sense. Uh, finding a way to, in which our governments will take a long term view, I think is fundamentally important. It's an area in which all my friends in China feel that they are superior in their decision making ability to our form of government. We obviously feel there's a lot to be said for democracy. They put emphasis on longer term decision making. Um, I don't think we have the answer. So uh, at that time, back in the 1950s, Lord Cobbold uh, was uh, Lord King's predecessor as governor of the Bank of England when in 1953 iron and steel were um, denationalized, privatized, wasn't a word used at the time by the Churchill government. Um, just uh, just taking a sidestep there, do you look back at any of your predecessors as governor of the Bank of England as ones who particularly informed your own 10 year stint? I, I don't think I did, uh, but I did find a great value in the study of financial history. In fact, as soon as I became governor, I set up a dining group which met twice a year comprising some people in the financial sector, some economic journalists, some academics. And we met twice a year to discuss a series of papers which had been drawn up by one of our members about events in the past, you know, the financial crisis of 1914, which is often forgotten in the excitement of the beginning of the First World War. There was a pretty dramatic financial crisis which engulfed Europe and the United States. Um, there are a whole series of episodes from the past and how people dealt with them were actually very helpful in thinking through the problems that we faced. So uh, the use of history, uh, I was arguing in Prospect magazine uh, last month that there should be a chief historian in government as a chief economist, as a chief statistician, as chief medical officer, chief scientist and so on, a chief historian to remind um, those who are taking decisions often very quickly about earlier precedent. Uh, it sounds that is very much uh, chiming with your own practice as uh, governor, but very few others have that historical mindedness. No, and it's, I, I'll give you one practical example. When in 2007 we could see that there were problems emerging in financial markets, we had created a, only you know, a year earlier a new system by which we provided access to liquidity to the commercial banks. Yeah. And so when the problems emerged in 2007, we knew that if we just waited 10 days to the next key monthly date, the banks would be able to ask us for whatever liquidity they needed. And we thought this would solve the problem. But it turned out they didn't ask us for anywhere near the amount of liquidity they needed. And we didn't really understand why to begin with. But when you look back to 1914, you see why. Because after the uh, creation, well, it was after the financial crisis in the US in um, 1906 7, the US Treasury printed a lot of banknotes for each commercial bank. They had their own symbol printed on the notes in those days and put them in a vault and said you can get access to these extra banknotes liquidity whenever you need them uh, if you come to us and borrow. And not one bank did so between then and the outbreak of the First World War. As soon as the First World War uh, broke out, every bank needed liquidity and there was no stigma attached for an individual bank to ask for more money. And what happened in 2007 was that no individual bank wanted to run the risk of being stigmatized in the financial markets by being seen to apply for more liquidity. Not an issue that anyone had confronted in previous several decades. The lesson was there in history and we didn't realize until after the event. Let's look a bit more at the utility of economics. Um, you were chief economist, by the way, for listeners, we've got Andy Haldane, the current 
Bank of England Chief Economist speaking later in the series. You uh, were an academic at uh, Cambridge and Birmingham, MIT, uh, Harvard. Do you think that economics as an academic uh, discipline, there'll be many of our economists listening in here, um, has changed sufficiently following the economic financial crisis uh, of uh, 2007, 8, 9? Well, in one respect, not. I, I, I don't want to be too critical because I think economics has produced some incredibly important insights. But it's important to stress that they're insights, which gives you a, a good way to think about the economy. They don't give you quantitative forecasts of what will happen. Most of the decisions that people have to make in the world to which economics is applied are one-off events, they're unique events, which you may learn something, you can learn insights from the past, but they're not actual repetitions of it. And so the pretense that you can construct quantitative models that enable you to predict things is I think a terrible mistake. And it's not what most economists do, but it's what the bit of economics that is most publicized in the media and on television is about. So we should, not, we should stop trying to forecast the future and instead think deeply about you know, what is going on and how should we cope with it. So you know, I think radical uncertainty, it's certainly John Kay and I really feel that this is something which economists have overlooked, the, the distinction between risk and uncertainty mm. that was formulated by Frank Knight and John Maynard Keynes in the first half of the 20th century, in the second half was ignored by the economics profession in the belief that you could always assume that people would have probabilities they could attach to every possible event and therefore you knew how they would behave, they'd maximize their expected happiness and you can then turn a handle of a model and out comes a clear prediction. I think that's a highly misleading way to think about it. You may get insights from such models but you do not get predictions. Looking at the handling of COVID, you said that um, there was a, a, a good general, a, a good plan, but not the officers to carry it out or the munitions to uh, to do the work. Uh, was there a good enough general? Uh, will the inquiry, inquiries that inevitably will uh, be coming at us down the line, um, do you think show up that there were uh, really serious errors uh, in judgment or is looking for uh, blame uh, the wrong thing to be doing? I don't think we should look for blame. I think we should look to draw lessons. And I think that one of the most important lessons will be that if you're going to take robustness and resilience seriously, you need a practical plan in which some people are put in charge of ensuring that things that are supposed to happen actually get delivered on the ground. That didn't happen with testing. It, it didn't happen with the delivery of personal protective equipment. And it didn't happen with the delivery of loans to the small business sector. Uh, none of these things were failures of a high level plan with committee structures. And indeed, it's somewhat ironic that the UK has a more distinguished record in developing the study of epidemiology than any other country. The, the key models that are used by mathematicians and now economists to model an epidemic were developed by two Scottish doctors in the 1920s. The textbook was written by Roy Anderson of Imperial College and Bob May of Oxford. Sadly, Bob May passed away a couple of weeks ago. These were both people who held positions of chief scientist in government departments. Um, so that all the expertise was there. Uh, but I somehow it's the ability to translate that expertise into giving insights to help polit politicians take make the judgments because the science doesn't tell us what we must do. Politicians still have to make judgments and I sense there was a a temptation to run away from taking responsibilities for those judgments and giving responsibility uh, to the scientists. But the scientists can't tell us what's going to happen. So, uh, but I think the, the biggest failing undoubtedly was the logistical problem of being unable to translate aspirations at a high level mm. 
into something that would happen on the ground. And I suspect, looking at the countries that have done best, that countries with a more decentralized system, health system, government system, have done better. And the highly centralized bureaucracy that is used to moving at a slow pace, consulting lots of people, is the worst kind of organization to deal with practical logistical problems where you've got to get something to happen by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And certainly in my experience in the Bank of England, we had one or two issues like that. And I just knew that we had to put different people in charge of an area because the person you'd want in charge, say of a banking area in peacetime, someone who would take a long view, good at policy work, plan slowly, deliberately, was not the person you needed when something had gone wrong and you had to put it right by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. You need different people to come in, yeah. build their own teams at that point. There's so many fascinating uh, questions. Uh, is it indeed the case that uh, the non-democratic countries have fared uh, better in managing? You hinted at that earlier, Lord King, in, in the talk. Um, and are the, the, the politicians that democracy throws up really good enough? I mean, uh, no prime minister has walked into number 10. They don't even have a job description to tell them what they have to do. They certainly have no uh, training and preparation for it. And that's just ordinary uh, day by day work, uh, let alone dealing with uh, the biggest pandemic uh, since the flu epidemic of 1918-19. Uh, now we have at least uh, 34 questions in. Uh, we're now into the third part. Uh, of this one hour, uh, which is 20 minutes on questions. I'm going to go for the first question from Steve Cook, uh, who says, how far do you feel uh, coronavirus will hide the economic impact of, first time we've mentioned it uh, today in 41 minutes, uh, Brexit? Well, it's certainly done a pretty good job of concealing it so far, but the Brexit negotiations are still continuing. There is a major difference of view between the EU and the UK, and I don't see how that can easily be bridged. The UK, you know, whether you're for or against Brexit doesn't matter for this point. The UK left partly in order to be able to have its own regulatory regime and its own legal regime. Uh, the EU seems to be arguing that if having left, you want a free trade agreement, then we must go back again and adopt their regulatory regime. There's no precedent for that when thinking about free trade agreements, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a political objective which the EU has of trying to make life more difficult for the UK. I, I'm not sure that this can be bridged, but we'll see. It's possible. I mean, politicians are uh, wonderfully skilled at coming up with a form of words that fudges an issue. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to fudge this one. If this can't be fudged, then frankly, it doesn't matter very much. We'll then have to leave under WTO rules and the impact of COVID-19 on that is very small, with one exception, which is that uh, irrespective of whether we get a free trade agreement or not, if we don't, then uh, or either way, really, businesses will need some time to prepare. If we get a free trade agreement, then it's probably Okay, they'll be able to carry on as, as we are. If we don't get one, businesses will need some time to prepare at a time when it looks as if in the second half of this year, they're going to be confronted with the challenge of reorganizing the way they conduct their businesses in order to comply with social distancing. That would lead to an argument, I think, not for postponing the ultimate decision or the negotiations on a free trade agreement, but for giving businesses a bit more time to prepare. That's something which we should know by the end of June, but uh, I don't think we need to take that decision now. The big question is whether or not there is any way to bridge this big gap of principle between the UK and the EU. I'm going to move straight on to Chris Brockbank, um, who's one of our mature students. Um, who says it may surprise some people that China has devalued its currency several times, most recently 2019. How does China get away with it? Well, exchange rates need to move. And I think one of the big causes of the economic crisis of 10 years ago, and just 
the same cause for weak economic growth in the past decade since the crisis, banking crisis ended is that we've had exchange rates that haven't moved very much. And the problem really is no longer China in this respect, because we used to think that the challenge of China was because it saved so much in its economy that it had a very large trade surplus. Actually, China doesn't have a large trade surplus now. The country or the currency block, which has by far the biggest trade surplus, is the euro area. And even if you take the last five years together, the euro area has had twice as large a trade surplus as China over those five years. China's surplus has been declining most of the while. The euro area surplus has been growing. And I think it's the inability to reset exchange rates both within the euro area and as a result, make it difficult to know what exchange rates should be outside between the euro area and other currencies. That's one of the causes of slow economic growth. So I think here's an area where I would put less weight on China as an issue than I would on what is going on in Europe. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Alistair asks about your view about whether coalitions within the country, uh, such as the Oxford to Cambridge arc, of which Buckingham uh, is part of, or the Midlands engine Northern powerhouse, are these going to be uh, come more important, uh, do you think, over the next decade? Well, I would have thought so, uh, certainly over the next decade, uh, partly because I think many people had come to the conclusion that the growing dominance of London in the British economy was not a healthy position. Um, you know, a number of journalists wrote articles saying that London could secede from the UK because uh, I don't know how it would feed itself if it did that, but it, <laughs> it was somehow because it was the, the 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 epitome of the success of the UK and the rest of the UK epitomised our failures, you know, old fashioned industry and so on. I think this is completely wrong. And I think that what we will need are different parts of the country, different arcs in your phrase, to take responsibility for themselves. I remember being very struck as governor going around the country that in Cornwall you could see uh, a region which had first of all relied on uh, envelopes from Whitehall containing cash and then one day the various groups within the, the Cornish economy, employers, trade unionists, colleges, just said, look, to hell with London. We will try and take greater control over our own fate. And they did so, I think, very successfully. This needs to be applied right across the country, I think. So these initiatives are very important. There's one other factor that will play into this in the next five years, which is the, if you'd asked me uh, last year, which were the most exciting places in the world to live? I think I would have said London and New York. Uh, lots of interesting people. Everything you wanted to do was taking place there. I wouldn't say that now. And I think for the next few years, people having seen the enormous disadvantage of an urban metropolis, um, the, 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 the virus has hit London and New York harder than most other parts of the world. This is it's, people are going to be very suspicious and nervous of these activities for a while. And I think it will take some while to get back to a state in which people yearn to live in these exciting cities and gravitate there. I think the benefits of living elsewhere with a different lifestyle, being able to to work from home and not have to travel such long distances, all of which will seem much more attractive now and could have a permanent impact on the way we work. Lindsay, um, one of our students, says, um, thank you for speaking. And why is it that the merest hint of a vaccine uh, that we see the markets become optimistic? They didn't seem to be um, uh, really, um, they didn't seem to be really uh, pricing for a recession at the beginning of what has become the COVID crisis, if I've got the question right. Well, I don't know why financial markets have moved so strongly on hints <laughs> that they're might be a vaccine. I think this, these waves of optimism and pessimism come and go. 
I think what is clearly true is that no one can really know what the future holds here. We don't know whether there is a vaccine, when it will be developed, if, if there is one, and how quickly it will take to produce on a scale that can be administered to everyone in the country so that we can just forget about the virus. Um, I, I think in a situation where there is such uncertainty, radical uncertainty, there's bound to be a good deal of volatility. People are you know, trying to clutch onto straws. They, they, take, they take hints. Uh, they're looking for quantitative measures for what might happen. And I don't think there are any. I think this is a time for, for cool heads and calmness. And I was quite struck on the radio this morning that when um, people were being interviewed, the, the experts did say, look, we don't yet know whether there's a vaccine and we can't predict when it will be available on a large scale. So these things can be taken out of context and exaggerated. And there's no doubt that I think the government feels under pressure to come up with some good news. Right. Um, uh, again, which is a, a problem with a uh, electoral cycle um, and a prime minister with uh, their own job to maintain against uh, circling wolves. Juan Castaneda, who's one of our monetary economists, Mervyn, uh, asked a bit of a technical question here, uh, remembering that many listeners uh, are not economists, uh, but I'm sure you will understand this. Does the current increase in broad money growth in most advanced economies, indeed very high in the USA, anticipate an inflationary cycle in two to three years? And does it matter? It doesn't necessarily uh, lead to expectations of higher inflation. Largely, I think, because if we were to see signs of that and it looked as if it was about to take off, central banks have, it's a very simple strategy for dealing with it, which is just to raise interest rates. Uh, now, whether they will feel that they have sufficient political independence to do that is the interesting question. I think it does matter. I think it would be a, a real problem if having spent so much time trying to reach a point at which, you know, in the great sweep of history, we were beginning to learn how to manage paper currencies. And I think despite the views of many in the economics profession, that it, inflation had nothing to do with money. It's very hard to define inflation without defining it in terms of a fall in the value of money. It, it does matter that we don't throw this away and that we maintain low and stable inflation yeah. and stay in a world in which people don't worry about inflation. The real threat, I think, to it doesn't come from the current observations on what's happening to broad money. It comes from the risk that the experience of this crisis and the measures that central banks, particularly in the United States, where the Federal Reserve has engaged in what one can only call quasi-fiscal policy, it's been doing things which normally governments do uh, to compensate for the lack of action at the federal level from the US. The US Treasury is trying to do a lot, but the, the, US, the, the Fed has stepped in and taken measures of its own of a fiscal nature. I think that we could see a repetition of what happened after the banking crisis when Congress said, you know, you, the Federal Reserve, claim to have done what you could and rescued us from a crisis, but you actually went right up to and possibly beyond your legal mandate. And so we're going to cut back your powers. And if politicians in the future felt that they could either overtly or covertly by appointing different kinds of people to the central bank, influence the determination of the central banks to maintain low inflation. That I think is where we would start to see inflation pick up and then it would be, I think, quite a worry and a problem. We have five minutes to go. I'm going to try and get through uh, three or even more questions. Nigel Adams uh, is taking you back Lord King to the Black Death and, and should the government have uh, learned from the research um, about what happened in the Black Death? Well, it's another example of historical analogies. Uh, I, I mean, COVID-19 is very different, I think, from the uh, 
Black Death, it, it's you can identify the kinds of people who are targeted by COVID-19. Um, we've been able to communicate with people right across the country in a way that was not possible then. Yeah. People could really only see it coming village by minute, village. Um, but I don't. Th I think, as a general point, Anthony, I, I take your your stricture, which is we're not very good at keeping the lessons from history in mind. Bill Robbins asks again on a similar theme, Mervyn. He's looking up back eight years for national security strategy, uh, and said that the two uh, major threats uh, then, um, along with the pandemic, were terrorism and a cyber attack. Um, and that the government appears to have taken terrorism and cyber attack more seriously uh, than a pandemic um, uh, on as a tier one threat. Why? Well, without, with, I, I, I can't judge that because without knowing the papers that will be revealed, I think, yeah. through the post-mortem on all this, it's hard to judge. And I think the, I mean, we've had episodes of terrorist attacks which have, enabled us bit by bit to put in place the logistical mechanisms to cope with it. We've learned from experience. I don't know how well prepared we would be to resist a cyber attack on, say, our electricity supply industry. But what we do know is that we weren't very well prepared at a logistical level. And I think one of the big questions for the post-mortem will be not that we failed to identify pandemics as a threat because we did, but we weren't in a position in practical terms to do enough to cope with it. Very quick question from Stephen Wilkinson, and you might not want to answer. How long do you think, Lord King, uh, the lockdown can last before the economy has to be reopened? I, I don't know. I, I think this is just an unknowable thing. I, I think we need a trial and error process of trying to restore the economic growth, but while maintaining social distancing until such time as we have a vaccine or population immunity, but neither seem to be close to hand. Um, and um, a final question. Um, I've tried to, to get a gender balance, uh, but this one is about anonymous. Uh, very serious question here. When do you hope to be able to watch your Aston Villa play again? <laughs> and well, would you yourself go to Villa Park? So I'm hoping, I mean, my, my plan would be that I don't think it makes sense to pretend that we can restart the season, much though the Premier League clubs want to do so purely for financial reasons. I think the whole validity of the season would end if we made the decisive matches played behind closed doors. So I would stop the season. I would award the championship, the Premier League championship to Liverpool. I'd have no a relegation. Big cheer, big cheer going up there, I can hear yeah. around the university. I would uh, have no relegation this year. I'll promote Leeds and West Bromwich Albion from the championship. And I'd say to the TV companies, they will get four extra rounds of games next year, two extra rounds the year after. That should compensate for the lack of games this season. They have to share some of the burden of the contractual arrangement uh, if they want to be in the market next time. Try and do a deal and then start the next season, probably sometime in August, uh, behind closed doors, where we recognise that the whole season begins again behind closed doors, because I think we have no idea when it will be safe to go to Villa Park. I would love to be there, but only when it was safe for everyone else to be there as well. And I wouldn't want to go there and see a game behind closed doors. And a final question, this is just a yes or a no. Would you sooner, this is really searching, watch a really great football match or a really great cricket game? I do one in the afternoon <laughs> all day long and then the football match in the evening. I'm not saying that you're allowed to uh, <laughs> have your cake and eat it. The Prime Minister does uh, and so if he does we can certainly allow that. Uh, Lord King, thank you very, very much indeed. There are masses of questions that we could ask, but we always finish the firesides on the uh, button of uh, the hour. Uh, thank you for, for talking um, with such erudition and such, um, such clear, lucid logic. Um, 
it, it's been a wonderful privilege. I know that I'm speaking for all my students, colleagues and the community uh, to you. Thank you also for what you do for the University, helping Ed Smith and Institute of Sports Humanities um, and your very considerable number of supporters at the University of Buckingham have uh, tripled as a result of this. Thank you very, very much for giving us an hour of your time. It's been my pleasure and my best wishes to everyone at the university. Thank you very much, Mervyn. Thank you. Thank and you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you.